Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We're in for a, uh, a really wonderful educational presentation and an absolute treat from a man who has devoted decades of his life now to the search for some of the truth about the abduction phenomena. Dr. David Jacobs, most of you probably don't know this, you know, had his own battle to keep his job. Yeah, it was a years-long battle, actually. In 1998, uh, for his efforts of uh, trying to reach some truth in these subjects, he had to fight for his academic life. Yeah, very similar to what John went through, and just as bad, but just not simply as publicly known. And in spite of all this, David continues to this day, and matter of fact, honestly, right now, he is working harder than ever to dig out new truths about what's happening with the abduction phenomena. There is no question that Dr. David Jacobs is amongst the top two or three abduction researchers in the world, and it is our honor to welcome him back to the Congress. Ladies and gentlemen, David Jacobs. Uh, thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you for all being here, for coming, and I uh, arrange myself here. And here are the arrows, and there's already a slide. And I, they asked me if, I, if they uh, can, uh, when I was going to start the PowerPoint presentation, and I said, you might as well start it now, because then I'll know what I'll be talking about. So here it is, and now I know what, I, what I'm going to say. The first thing I want to say is, of course, is, uh, is thank the, the Browns for inviting me here again and, uh, and say how sorry I am for the tragedy that the family has, has endured recently. Uh, and how happy I am also that the, converse, that the convention has, has continued and, and there's so, there are an awful lot of people out here and, and a lot of people who have had the good sense to stay away too, I notice. But um, today I want to talk about uh, something that, that is not talked about a whole lot and basically it has to do with what do abductees do when they're not being abducted? which is kind of an odd way of putting things. It has to do with, with people who are aware abductees. Now, I'm not going to be talking about people who are uh, uh, unaware and, and sort of are, are maybe floating around a little bit trying to come to terms with what's going on with them and, 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 and searching for answers and all that. These are people who I have worked with and who pretty much know what has happened to them and, and, the, and, and certain kind of problems then are presented to them. And, uh, uh, and the first thing I want to talk about is something that people have, have sort of gone back and forth about. And in fact, uh, I attended uh, an abductee group last night that was presided over by Yvonne Smith and uh, managed, to, managed to force my way onto them. And, um, they were talking about the tra trauma sometimes involved with, with this, this phenomenon. And uh, one thing that you have to understand in terms of traumatic experiences and how tra traumatic this is, is that the abduction phenomenon begins in infancy and goes to old age. So when somebody comes to me and they say, I was first abducted at the age of 22, uh, I, I automatically know, well, that's probably the first one that they partially remember as being an actual abduction event, but they probably had a whole bunch before then. Um, and in fact, that has turned out to be true in virtually every case, in, in virtually every case that, that I've been able to look at. Uh, sometimes I only see a person once, and so I, I, you know, I can't tell what that person But, but in every, every person I've had a, a long sort of experience with in terms of examining them, that has been true. And uh, therefore, uh, the, the events have happened many, many times. Let's just say a person is 40 years old, 
and they come to me, or 50 years old or something like that, they come to me for the first time and they say, I think things have been happening to me. I remember something when I was, you know, 12 and, and, and then 28 and then so, something happened when I was 42 and so forth. Well, when we begin to look into it, you begin to realize that these events happen with tremendous uh, rapidity there and frequency. Uh, they are, uh, people are abducted quite a lot of times and they don't know it. They are abducted, uh, the, the lowest amount of abductions I've ever measured in a person I was working with was something like, uh, I can't remember, it was like nine or 11 abductions in a year. And that was the lowest number I've ever seen. So the question then is when you begin to do ab abduction event uh, hypnosis, and you're dealing with a person who might have had, let's just say, 10 abduction events for 40 years. You see, you're suddenly you're dealing with 400, and that's the lowest. So let's just say you're dealing, we'll be real conservative, and you're only dealing with 200 abduction events in a person's life, or even 100. The question then is, is there going to be the same amount of trauma every single time because they're used to it from the time that they were born and the reason we know that they're used to it from the time that they were born or at least had it with the time they were born is because parents are abducted with their babies and with small children so the question then is you know how much trauma is there and, and I found that First of all, if it were to happen to me once or twice, it would scare the hell out of me, obviously. I, I would be traumatized for life. There's no doubt about that. But there is a certain aspect of this that is part of people's lives, and they kind of know what is going on, and they, they know the drill, so to speak. And I found that it is the act of remembering for the first time that is really the most frightening thing that you can that they can do because the second time I do a session with them it's a little less frightening but it is frightening the 30th time I do a session with them it's not frightening at all they just know what's going on and, and so that the that that sense of overwhelming trauma really doesn't exist for them this is not to say that they're not scared or fearful that is true but 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 there are, these are traumatic events in large part through recall of them, and that can be overcome, actually. Um, so I'm not going to be talking about the trauma so much involved with it. I'm going to be talking about how, what happens to them in their normal li lifespan, in their normal lifetime, because these abductions obviously have enormous and important effect on their lives. One of the greatest effects, of course, is just simply knowing that it's going on and knowing that you're a person who, is, who has a different life that you lead, in essence. One that is happening even unbeknownst to you in an odd way. That this, this, there's a tremendous amount of time that you spent not knowing what is happening, not, not even being aware of. Uh, that is a very odd concept to sort of grasp for people. It's something that, that, that is um, uh, inconceivable almost, unless, of course, you have some sort of multiple personality disorder or something like that, and you're not aware, although most alters are aware of other alters, but it's, it's a complicated business and, and it, it's just not a normal situation. Um, so the first thing that happens to them, of course, is this kind of what John Mack used to call uh, ontological shock, that is to say the shock of knowledge and, and, and this sort of idea that, oh my God, this is actually happening to me. Um, and the first thing that you also notice with them is that they have certain fears, fears that, that, that go along with this, that they've never been able to explain. They might be frightened, for example, of um, a certain stretch of road. For example, in this, in this particular slide, you can see that, uh, that a person would be traveling down a road and suddenly there's an object 
parked, so to speak, waiting for him or her. Uh, as the car stops, they're let out and into this object or whatever. Uh, this is a, a, uh, an event that happened to a, a woman, and she was trying to describe to me how large this object was, how it fit past the two lanes of the highway and went off into a sort of a berm on either side. Um, and then, for some reason or other, they forget this. Well, not for some reason, but, but they forget what happened, and then they, all they know is they're afraid of that place now. They don't want to go down that road anymore. That road is a road that they want to avoid. I've had people tell me how they had, they'll travel miles around so that they don't have to go down this particular road. Um, and I found that to be very, very common. Uh, and of course, there's something that I call the funnel effect, where people are frightened that it's going to happen to them at any time. It's not just fear of a place, it's fear of, let's just say, going to sleep at night. Because a minimum of 40% of all the abductions that I've looked at happen at night when people are sleeping. Uh, maybe the other 60% happen uh, some at night when they're not asleep, they're watching television a lot during the day and, and, and so forth. So the first thing that happens is they think, uh-oh, I hear a noise, I hear a noise, it, it, there's a noise, it's, it's them, they're coming, they're, they're going to come after me, uh, you know, and, and I've got to get ready now, and, and, and then they, and I'm not going to go to sleep, and I'm, I'm going to sit up here, and I'm going to wait, and, it's, and I'm going to catch them, and, and then they sit up all night long, and it doesn't happen. But it's like they funnel almost anything unusual into the phenomenon, so they will think to themselves, well, now I know why I am frightened of, uh, well, now I know why I like strawberry ice cream, or now I know why I put my pants legs on, uh, my pants on one leg at a time, or whatever it is, they funnel everything into the abduction phenomenon, and it starts to take over their lives, and I warn people, that's, don't do that. <laughs> it's, it's, if you hear noises at night, it's just burglars. Go back to sleep, it's all right. <laughs> Um, and uh, a lot of them sleep for, with protection. You know, they, they have guns under their pillows and knives and, and all the rest of this stuff. Uh, they, sleep, they can't sleep at all at night. So, or they, uh, so they, they, sleep, they, they only go to sleep when the sun comes up. And even then, they sleep with the radio on, they sleep with the television on, they sleep with lights on if they do at night, and on and on and on. And, and it just, the whole thing can be very, very, very upsetting for their normal lives. Um, well, this fear of places, though, is, is actually an important one, and, and many, many, many abductees have it. They're fra afraid of their backyard. They're afraid of their basement. They're afraid of some odd room in their house. They don't want to go into the dining room or whatever. They're, 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 that's something they would never do. Uh, and, uh, and you get this whole sort of range of, of fears. Uh, uh, now, one of the, the most important things that happens is, is coming back, and I know that Bud Hopkins has talked about this quite a bit, and so have I, is coming back with, with unusual bruises and, fear and marks uh, on people's bodies and on all the rest of that stuff, and puzzling, like, what? How, how could this happen? How did I ever, how did this happen? I, I have a slide somewhere here. Uh, we'll just... Here, this is a, just a straight puncture wound. Uh, this woman actually woke up with uh, about four on her face and several on her arms. And this is just a close-up of a, a puncture wound on her arm. Uh, and here is a woman uh, who has, uh, it's, I don't know if that's, that's easy to see, but there's, there's bruising on her arm, inside her arm and on the outside. And it actually was all over her arm. And it was actually on both arms as well. And there's a lot of bruising on her legs. And, and normally, if you're sleeping alone at night in your bed, in your feather bed, you're not going to get all bruised up. You're not going to wake up, unless, of course, you've had abduction experiences where this is extremely common, extremely common. Well, this can be taken actually into different areas. For example, uh, one time a person was in, uh, came to my uh, um, abduction group and she had a broken wrist. Broken wrist. I said, well, how, how did that happen? You know, how, how'd you get... 
And her answer was, I don't know. Well, that's not an answer a 40-year-old person gives. You don't, if you were to break your wrist, you tend to remember what happened that would cause that. You know, it, it might stick in your mind. And uh, she said she just sort of woke up with it and it hurt like hell and so she had to go to the doctor and there was a, there was a broken bone. And uh, of course that's not possible because once again when you're asleep at night you don't break your bones normally. I mean at least it hasn't happened to me in a long time. But um, <laughs> so we did a session on that and, um, and one of the things they did with her was they uh, these are hybrids now, and I'm going to be talking in large part about hybrids, but that is to say a mixture of human and alien, and uh, I, I, a lot of people have been talking about this recently, and of course it was discovered by Bud Hopkins uh, back in the early 80s, uh, and, and it is, it's a central feature of the abduction phenomenon. But basically they got angry at her for some reason or another, uh, primarily because she had been talking to me, and they did not want her to do that. And one of the things they do, and I've noticed in terms of trying to keep abductees, what they call in compliance, is they have a certain modus operandi. There's a certain way in which they go about physically punishing people because they understand that physical punishment scares people to death. So they would push people down, push you down on the floor, and then pick up women, for example, by their hair. And they do other things as well. Well, they pushed her down. She fell back and she put her arms out to break her fall, broke her wrist. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't an intentional thing to break her wrist, but she woke up in the morning with a broken wrist. And that's sort of something that you just kind of have to live with. The idea of you've got a broken bone and you don't know how it came came about and it's probably best that they would say to each other, it's probably best not to think about how I got this. That would be the best thing to do. I won't question the fact that I have a broken bone in my body. I'll just get it fixed and that's it. Uh, one time I had a person who was um, with a group of hybrids and um, she broke away. They were, that was a long story and, and you'll just have to sort of go along with this for a second. But this was years ago. She was in a car, and she managed to open the car door and run. And they were actually in a wooded area, and she fell. It was at night. She fell into a kind of ravine, broke her ankle. So in essence, she woke up the next morning with a broken ankle. Both these were at night. Uh, I have a, uh, another story of a woman who presented herself with broken enamel from her tooth. She, there's no, she had a, a long split, and I have a slide of it here, which I'll show you in a second. And we could not imagine how something like that could have ever happened. This is something that's just so, so odd, so strange. How do you break your tooth, of all things? during an abduction event. Well, we did a session on it, and uh, it was one of those things where you, you, would, you just wouldn't, it was unexpected. She was uh, on board an object. She uh, uh, realized that she had, had, she had more sort of consciousness than she normally has, and she realized that she had more physical abilities as, than she normally has, and she realized that this gray guy who was standing in front of her probably deserved a really hard kick in the shins. So she kicked him and turned around to run, but there was a low-hanging wall right behind her, which she didn't realize. So she turned around and just whacked her face on the wall and chipped her tooth. So once again, it wasn't something that they had actually done to her, but she did in fact wind up with a, a chipped tooth. There's a, I have a, a picture of it somewhere here. There it is right there. 
and uh, she was, it was extremely embarrassing for her, extremely embarrassing for her. I had to get her to open her mouth to show me because she uh, well understood the fact that, um, uh, oops, I'll just go to a zero here for a second, that um, people don't like to talk to people who's Got, who have messed up teeth, broken teeth, and all the rest of that, and, and so she, uh, she didn't, it was difficult for her, it was very difficult for her, obviously, until she had it repaired. But the point is that, that these are sort of these physical things that people have to live with, and this affects their normal lives. There's there all sorts of other problems like this, too. Now, one of the problems for people who have a lot of abductions at night, and, and some people have most of their abductions during the day, and some people have most abductions during the night, but one of the problems is that in recent years, there has been a dramatic increase in the frequency of abductions for some abductees, more so than I have ever seen in my life. I've been doing uh, hypnosis of abductees since 1986, I have never seen anything like it. And they would take people sometimes on a nightly basis. That meant that people were getting two hours of sleep a night, three hours of sleep. Well, if that happens long enough, you can get all sorts of problems. Physical problems can, can result from this. I, I don't know whether this is true or not, but a nurse told me that one of the things that happens is it, it can compromise your immune system and that you just have your lack of sleep means that you have you can't regenerate your muscles you can't regenerate your ability to to stop uh, yeah, diseases and so forth and i have noticed that a lot of abductees complain about things like epstein barr syndrome which is a uh, 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 sort of uh, chronic fatigue syndrome uh, uh, and fibromyalgia which is a problem uh, muscles uh, muscle pains and so forth and this might in fact be related to lack of sleep. Lack of sleep also means you're tired all the time and in danger of falling asleep at the wheel when you're driving your kids home from school. Lack of sleep means that you're cranky a lot. You, you don't have that, the, that, that regenerative power so you feel better in the morning and all that. It can be and has been a huge problem for people. Uh, and the question is, how do they explain the fact that they're tired all the time? And the answer is they don't. Because many people live in households that have no, where they have no support. Uh, that it's very difficult for them to, to explain anything that's going on to their spouses. And uh, the spouse thinks that they're nuts, you know. And that leads to another sort of hidden problem of abductees. And the problem is, Supposing you and your sp spouse want to get divorced. You've been married for a while and enough is enough. You've had it. And the spouse knows that you, male or female, you are an abductee. The first thing that spouse is going to do, and this has already happened a number of times, is immediately go to court, say she or he says that they're being abducted by aliens, having sex with aliens, I want the kids. This is a big problem. And the question then becomes, should the spouse ever say anything to the, the husband or the wife? And oftentimes they elect to say nothing. No, absolutely no. The, the husband, for example, doesn't have a need to know. And, uh, and, and they don't. But the, then whatever support the spouse can give is not there. So they can't rely on their husband or their wife to help them with this. All they can rely on is the fact that they're protecting themselves in the future in case anything uh, untoward happens, you know, and protecting the children and so forth. Uh, and this can be very, very difficult for people as well. Well, there are other th odd things that you, you never would expect. Missing objects from the house. If there's a lot of abduction activity, oftentimes these beings, uh, uh, our special friends, as I call them, uh, will take things. This one woman was telling me that she lost, she had this collection of comic books when she was a kid. And one day they were gone, and she blamed her brother. 
and she never got over it. She was always angry at her brother for years after that for stealing her comic books, although the comic books could not be found in the house. But she was certain her brother, who was this young kid, and she was young also, had done it. And she never got the comic books back. And we did a session once where these beings came into the house and took her comic books for various reasons. We've seen this before. I took a stack of books, and including her comic books, and uh, she woke up and then they were gone and that was that for the next 20 years it was lodged in her brain that her brother had done it and then she said she'd have to she's got to go to her brother and apologize now and say yeah this wasn't it but it it affected her family life it doesn't seem like a big deal to us but for her it was a big deal here's another one that comes out of the blue hair cutting a woman will wake up and there's a lock of hair taken out, except that it is an enormous lie, it's a huge chunk. They have to go and get a haircut to match whatever was done to them because it looks like somebody cut a huge chunk of the hair out of their head, which they did, of course. But the question is, before they're aware of abductees, is who could have done it? Well, the only person who could have done it was their brother or their sister. And once again, they blame their sibling, you know, for doing this. And the sibling says, what are are you talking about? I didn't cut your hair. I'm I'm innocent, you know. But they are the only people who could have done it. Therefore, they did do it. And therefore, they are lying. And this is, and for a a younger girl to have a a large chunk of hair cut out of her hair, this is a, a, a very, it's a big deal for anybody, obviously. And it affects their lives. It affects their relationships with, with, with their families and all that. It does, and once again, it doesn't seem like much, but it causes fights and, and all sorts of other problems. And, and it's, it can be a, a serious situation. Well, some people will have these experiences and they just say to themselves, oh, this is just part of normal life. For example, uh, one time I was in the outer office of the history department and I was talking about the subject and a student came up to me and said, oh, I didn't know you were interested in this. And I said, uh, well, yeah, I've got a passing interest in it, you know. And, and um, she said, well, uh, uh, I said, how, why, have you ever seen a UFO, you know, or anything like that? And she said, uh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, lots of times. I said, well, come on into my office and, and, you know, we'll talk a little bit about it. Now, when a student comes into my office to talk about experiences or things that they've seen, uh, I remain poker-faced throughout the whole thing. There's no way I'm ever going to say, oh, yeah, you're, you're, you're an abductee, you're one of them. I'm not going to do that, obviously. I just listen and, and, and pass no judgment. But she told me the following story. She said when she was six years old, for some reason or another, she woke up in the middle of the night, she looked out and she ran through the window and looked out the window. And out the window, and I'll, I'll give you an example of what this looks like, although this is not what happened, what she in fact saw as I go by these things here. Out the window, she could see a, uh, a people uh, coming out of an object and, uh, and, and they were small and they were gray, although this is not it, but it's something like that. And, um, Just as she was looking at this, her mother came running into the room, burst into the room saying, hide, hide, they're going to get us, hide, hide. And that's the last thing she remembers. So I said to her, well, how do you, how do you reconcile this? I mean, how do you, what do you think this was? And she said, well, my mother explained to me at the time that this is just normal life. Everybody has these kinds of experiences. This is what goes on. This is what's part of being human. So she doesn't really think about it much because this is just what everybody has these things, you know. I said, okay, <laughs> I'm not going to say no, that doesn't happen to everybody, and uh, uh, I just, uh, because I'm poker-faced. But, um, but she was able to incorporate this into her life and live with it as a normal kind of situation. Uh, and oftentimes uh, there'll be a situation where they, people will see things in their house, and uh, here's uh, this, this uh, being uh, standing in the, in, the, in the living room, you know. And they'll in some way be able to reconcile this as just sort of another realm. There's like a, some, uh, some other kind of 
alternative reality that they that that sometimes intrudes on them but doesn't bother them. Uh, here's another one in in a bedroom situation where uh, this woman is lying in bed. She uh, drew this herself, of course. Where these things happen, and all I remember is these little snippets. But it's okay. They're they're, they're able to sort of get along with it, and yet. At the same time, they know that something is wrong, and they have this nagging feeling all the time, constantly, that, they, that something is off, something is different. When they then come to me and begin to, to examine these experiences, they, they realize that, that these things shouldn't be happening, that, that this is not sort of normal life and all that. Um, once they begin to realize what's going on, one of the things that happens is, of course, is that they become very frightened of other people finding out. Nobody should ever know this. This will make me look bad. I support this conclusion. <laughs> I tell them, you have to be discreet. The main problem is the workplace. They go to work and they start telling their fellow workers, well, last night I, you know, I was on Mars or something like that, then uh, uh, they're not going to have a job pretty soon. It's going to happen, and particularly if they continue to talk about it. Uh, and, and once you mention that you've been abducted, people don't forget that. That will stick in people's minds for as long as you ever work at that place. It'll never go away. So I tell them you have to be discreet. And in fact, I do have cases of people who were let go because they just talked about this subject a little too much, and they were considered to be too odd by their other workers, and it just wasn't the place for them, and maybe they should seek their fortunes elsewhere. Uh, and uh, uh, so they have to be very, very careful, and I emphasize the workplace. Telling their relatives might be a little safer. Telling their friends is iffy. If they tell their friends, the question is, how close are they to their friends? And will their friend really understand? And will they really have that friend very long? Uh, you, once you say that you're abducted, you are immediately categorized, categorized as a lunatic, as a nutcase. Well, you can't tell fantasy from reality. Uh, and that, that, that puts a friendship on a whole different basis, you know what I mean? Uh, because whoever is your friend has, got to, has to deal with that. So they have to make the decision as to whether they want to, uh, to do this or not. Uh, whether they want to tell their friends uh, you know, that they, they've been abducted or, or just let it slide. And, uh, uh, my advice is uh, make up their own minds, you know, it's their lives, but uh, letting it slide doesn't hurt anybody, and telling people can hurt, can hurt you, so just be very, very, very careful. Well, there's other things, too, as we go deeper into this. Uh, last night at the uh, abduction group, uh, one of the people brought out the fact that that uh, they, they felt that they had sort of merged with a being, that, that he had gotten or she had gotten very close to her, and, and they kind of become one. And, and I recognize this as, as, a, as a procedure whereby uh, these beings will um, uh, generate feelings in people. And, and, and one of the things that you realize during, in dealing with the subject is that these beings, the gray beings who we know and love, and also the hybrids can, in fact, control us. If they can't control us, they couldn't control us, there wouldn't be any abduction phenomenon. They will just run. As soon as they saw them coming into the room, they get out the 38 and blow their heads off. I mean, there, there wouldn't be an abduction phenomenon. There would be something else, but it wouldn't be. So they are controlled, and this takes place in secret. So they know something is going on, and oftentimes positive feelings are generated by hybrids as well. Positive for them. And they know that they know somebody up there who they really like a lot. Love. They love this person. 
I was giving a talk in, uh, near Washington, D.C. once many years ago, and there was a, I was at a hotel, and there was a, a woman who, uh, a young woman, who's 21 years old, who was waiting for me in the lobby afterwards, and she told me that she uh, had a sort of dream lover. I said, well, that's interesting. And, and she'd also had all these UFO sightings and these other weird experiences and so forth. But, but this dream lover had, was really bothering her. It was, it was something that she liked a lot, but she didn't want to deal with. And the problem was is that the dream lover uh, had gotten to the point where she was doing nothing but waiting for him to come. And she had no social life anymore. She had broken off from everybody. She didn't go out with anybody, and all she did was wait for this guy to come and visit her who she loved. And the problem was is that she knew something was wrong. This is not right. She wanted to go out. She wanted to have other friends and, 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 and uh, boyfriends or whatever it was, but, but it was her dream lover. It was all she was interested in, and that was it. And it was destroying her life. Everything was being funneled into this. She couldn't get it out of her mind. So she, she came up to, to uh, Philadelphia, where I, where I live, and we did a couple of sessions about this. And uh, sure enough, it was this hybrid guy who she loved beyond imagination. And uh, he would come and visit her, and we did a couple of different times when he would come. And uh, they, would, they got along very well, if you know what I mean. And, uh, and, they, uh, and then he would leave, and, and she was sad, and etc. And there was another problem. And the other problem was that she was African-American and the hybrid was not. And this put up conflicts in her own mind of, 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 of all sorts of things that she had been brought up to, to sort of agree with and, and, and she always assumed that she would marry another African-American guy and so forth. And, and, and this was very conflicting to her. Uh, and, uh, and yet she loved him. And I had to explain to her, look it, you're entitled to your own life. Uh, you know, you're, you're entitled to get married. You're entitled to have kids. This is, you know, you're, you're a human being. You, you know, this is what you, what, what you want to strive for. You're entitled to lead a normal life. Because what's happening here is not your call. This is not your, this is not your, your, your decision. This is not your choice. This is something that they are doing to you for their particular purposes, whether you love it or not. You still can't say no. And, um, and I don't know whether what happened, she, uh, it, it, coming up was very difficult for her, so she, she didn't, uh, we didn't do many sessions, but the fact was that, that this very sort of nice situation in, in, on one level was in the process of really kind of truncating her ability to have a normal social life and go out with her friends and, and meet guys and all the rest of that stuff, you know. And, and it's, it's odd. You wouldn't, you wouldn't normally think that something like that would happen as we just, uh, oh, here's another slide where this is a situation here where it's the same kind of thing. Uh, uh, a kid is abducted and uh, he's, he's abducted from this area and this is sort of a, uh, a schematic drawing of how he did it. He was in, he saw a UFO, uh, uh, where is my cursor here? Here, and then uh, he went to here, and then he and his friends hid over here, and then they were made to stand up, he and his two friends, and then he was lifted up into the sky, and his friend was here. And I might have shown this slide before. The point is, is that, that this is a situation where the question is then, how do you deal with your friend the next time you see him? And the friend says, uh, you know, well, where were you? Uh, you were there well, one time, and then suddenly you were missing, and then we looked all over for you. This is extremely common, and you never, we never found you again. Well, where were you? We didn't even see you go. And your answer is, um, there is no answer. The person thought they were there the whole time. They were playing. They were, uh, they, but sometimes there is an answer, and you have to make up an excuse. 
Oh, well, uh, I, I, had to, uh, um, I, I, I had to go over a little ridge, and then I saw uh, a friend of mine who said that my mother was looking for me, so I just went home. That would be an excuse that is not true. But it seemed like, seems like the right thing to say, so you don't have to confront the idea that you were missing and people noticed it and looked for you. Uh, if this happens enough, you've got to start making up a lot of excuses becomes bothersome. There are other sort of, as we go more and deeper and deeper into this, into the hidden world of abductees, uh, you have situations whereby uh, sometimes kids are abducted from school and they don't know where they were and they come back. I have this one woman uh, who uh, lives in Scotland who was abducted during recess and then brought back maybe 45 minutes later, but school had already begun 15 minutes beforehand. Uh, the classes had begun, and she found herself in the hallway without a hall pass, in other words, without permission, and was immediately accosted by a teacher because she, had, uh, she was uh, out of class, she had no idea where she was or why she was out of class and couldn't explain it to the teacher who used corporal punishment on her, beating her about the legs, as I remember, uh, for, as her punishment. Well, this can sour you on school a little bit, you know. I mean, you think, you think wait a minute, I, I wasn't doing anything wrong. I thought I was, everything was okay and all that. Um, so this can be particularly uh, difficult. Well, with, in these later years now, with lots and lots of abductions happening, you get unique problems that I've never heard before. For example, one problem that I've, ha I've had is a person is abducted after she gets up in the morning. Kids leave for school, husband leaves for work, she's alone, and that's when she's abducted. The problem is, is that she has a couple of kids who have difficulties at school. And uh, uh, one is a special needs child. And she uses her cell phone as the alarm to wake her up in the morning, and she, she depends on her cell phone for everything. Oftentimes things will happen at school and they call her and there's no answer. She has missed as many as six or seven phone calls frantically from school about the kid being sick, come and pick up the kid, the kid acting up, come and pick up the kid, she needs to come in and deal with the kid right now and that, and they can't get a hold of her. And this makes her so angry, she's always, always, always angry at this because it's getting in the way of her ability to care for her children. And these are emergency situations where the school is calling her and she misses everyone that she can tell by her cell phone that, that they called at 10, they called at 11, they called at 11.15, they called at 11.20, they called, you know, that sort of stuff. And, and she, she has no idea where she was. Now she knows, of course, she's, she's somewhere else. But the fact is, is that she's angry now because this can be a difficult situation. Obviously, it's, it's, these are her children, and she's filled with guilt that she can't be there. So she has to make up excuses to the, uh, to the school. Well, I was busy, or I was sick, I was this, or I must have been in the bathroom and I didn't hear, you know, uh, anything. And, and eventually, she said she starts to, you, you run out of excuses. As they told her, she's one of the most difficult people they've ever dealt with in trying to get a hold of in the morning. No, no parents are like that. If they know the parents are at work, they call the parent at work. If they know the parents are at home, they call the parents at home. And if you have a cell phone, the cell phone is with you at all times, and they call her on her cell, and she never answers. If this goes on long enough, I, you can actually see a scenario of the state stepping in and saying you're not taking care of your children well enough or, or some horrific thing like that. I hope it doesn't lead to that and it may not. But you can see a situation where something like that could happen. And there's nothing she can do about that. Absolutely nothing. It's a very, very difficult situation. Then she says she's abducted so much now that 
she has to start making up excuses beforehand. Now, if she goes to the market and says, I'll be home in 20 minutes, and she comes home four hours later with a carton of milk, um, she's going to have to tell her family why she's missing, because she's a, an aware abductee. So she has to make up an excuse first. I'll tell them this if I come back four hours later. So she spends a large part of her time thinking about how she can justify missing time sequences that she knows are going to happen to her, which is I, it's such an odd thing to think of. You don't, you don't normally, this is not, you know, you're not going to be doing this a whole lot in a normal life, you know what I mean? This is not something that's, that's going to take over uh, your non-abductee life. You don't have to think about something like that ever. And, of course, she thinks about the fact that, as all people do, that she's abducted, her children are abducted. She can't prevent her children from being abducted. She lives in guilt for that. And, of course, kids, when they're abducted, and I've dealt with a lot of people who, you know, who had abdu childhood abductions, obviously, and oftentimes they feel angry that, that their mother or their father or both parents can't protect them from being abducted as well. Uh, and, of course, the parents, I have to explain to them, well, the parents want to, but they, it's, not, they, it's not in their choice either. It's not, not in their power to do this, you know, and then they, they, they understand that obviously as an adult, but as a child, it can build up resentment and, and, and can sort of drive a wedge sometimes in families. It's a difficult situation. The opposite thing happens sometimes. I dealt with a, a woman who was a, a person who, who had a, a kind of epiphany one day. She'd been abducted all her life, of course, and she had gone out with a lot of guys, and, and uh, she had been married once, and then divorced, and so forth. And then one day she saw the man of her dreams. The man of her dreams. This was a guy who she was uncontrollably attracted to. It was uncontrollable. She could not keep away from him. She jumped on his bones every time she saw him. It was out of her control. She loved him. This was the guy. She was 37 years old. He was 75. He was short. He was bald. He wore thick horn rim, you know, turtle horn, horn rim glasses. He was the man of her dreams. They got married. I mean, this is serious business. <laughs> All the while thinking, she's thinking to herself, why is he the man of my dreams? Why am I getting married to him? But I know I love him. Uh, and then eventually she realized something is wrong. <laughs> something has been wrong. And they, they slept in separate bedrooms and, and all that. And, and he died when he was about 87. And they were still married. And, um, uh, but they, they, li they learned to live their own lives. But it was such an odd thing, and then she realized that, that all these sort of loving feelings that are actually neurological procedures uh, that are done by gray beings had been transferred to her. So instead of driving a wedge in some way, it drew her close to, to this guy she met, uh, who actually was a, I can't tell you who he was, but he was a prominent person in the Philadelphia area. Uh, whose death was a major event and, uh, and so forth. But, um, uh, but the fact was is that he wasn't her type. Let's put it that way. Uh, and she knew it. And yet she had this uncontrollable urge to be with him. Uh, she sort of laughs about it to a certain extent now and is remarried and all that. And... Uh, but it was a very unusual uh, episode in her life that, to a certain extent, affected the course of her life in a way that she probably wouldn't have wanted to have happen, you know. Um, well, there are other things that happen as well. I mean, there are people who, uh, uh, who have 
any number of, of situations that come up with him with them that relate primarily to the idea that they must hide the subject, they must keep it secret, and yet at the same time they're tremendously drawn to it in some way, and it starts to take over their life. Now, sometimes this can go two ways. One woman I dealt with, this woman in Scotland, was told when she was 12 years old that she must never go to school again. So she fought and fought and fought and fought and fought with her parents, both of whom were intellectuals, fought with them, fought with them, school teachers and so forth, fought with them, fought with them, and forced the issue, and they agreed to homeschooling. She couldn't care less about homeschooling, never picked up a book, and never learned anything. <laughs> she, because it didn't matter to her. She knew she didn't have to do that, that it was not necessary. Then when she was a teenager, she was told she must never be with a boy. Never, ever, ever. This was not, not to happen. So she didn't have a boyfriend. She wanted to have a boyfriend. She wanted to. But she couldn't, and she knew she just couldn't. Eventually, she fought it and fought it and fought it, and she got married. And then the marriage lasted for about five years or so, and then, and then they were divorced, and, and they're still on amicable terms. But she was sort of relieved. Although the guy was a pretty nice guy, apparently, she was relieved to be not married. It wasn't that she was relieved to be divorced from him. She was relieved to be not married again. And, and free and single. And then she was told she must never have kids. And in fact, she tried to have kids, and un, it was unfortunate. She had several miscarriages, and, and uh, 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 it was a, a, an awful situation. But she then became sort of independent. Then she, she, she has disability problems, and she's on disability, and uh, she lives alone. And the amount of abductions that have occurred to her has been just unbelievable. And she, they have began to rule her life. They would say to her, you cannot leave the, uh, your apartment now. You cannot leave it. You know, we, we, we must be here at, all, at these times. So she would force herself to go out. And she'd walk down to this main street where she lived nearby, and she'd go shopping or something like that. And then she'd come back, and they would be really angry. We told you not to do that. That was not right. You cannot do that. That was not good. That was bad. Then one day she'd get the urge, she must leave the, uh, her apartment. Now she must leave. So she would walk down and just walk around. And she would go here and there, but no, I have no reason why she was there. And then one time she tried to come home but she knew it was too early to come home. And in fact, she was stopped. Somebody came up to her on the street and said, you must not go, it's not, you, you can't go home yet, you have to wait. So she stood there with him and waited, and like they were standing on a sidewalk waiting for a bus. And they waited and waited, waited and then he said, okay, it's all right to go home now. And then he left and she returned home. And she got the sense that they were using her apartment for some reason or another, which she didn't know when she was gone. And in fact, they were. We did several sessions on this, and they told her at one of these sessions that, uh, they, that uh, there were some times when they were going to be using her apartment and she couldn't be there, and that was that. And it was all hybrid stuff. Hybrid, not gray guys, but hybrids. And over the years, there's been a shift towards people talking more and more about hybrids and, and hybrid life. And you notice I, I haven't talked too much about the standard issue grays at all in this talk. It's mainly hybrids. And when I first began doing this research, in, in doing my own hypnosis in 86, there was very little to do with hybrids. There were hybrids around, and, and there was what I call the personal project hybrid and, and, and so forth. But over the years, I've seen a growth of hybrid activity. It started out primarily with 
doing procedures, helping the gray aliens do things, coming down, getting people, getting them up, getting their clothes on, uh, off rather, and you know, doing this and doing that and so forth uh, during the abduction sequence. Then I began to find uh, abductions where there was quite a lot of hybrid activity, where, where there were hybrids who were really, you know, who were not just helping, they were actually doing a lot of the, some of the procedures. And of course the grays were there and the grays were helping this and the grays were doing this and the grays were doing that. Then people began to tell me, and this was already uh, 10 years ago, that, they were, that there were whole abduction sequences with nothing but hybrids, conducted by nothing but hybrids. That's all there were, was just hybrids doing everything, and there weren't any grays around at all. I thought, I think I'm spotting a trend. <laughs> I don't know, but, uh, but the people never told me this before. Now they're all starting to tell me this, and I'm hearing this all the time. And now I'm hearing all these other stories where hybrids are in their apartments and hybrids are in their homes and hybrids are taking stuff from their homes and they're doing this with hybrids and they're doing that with hybrids. And I'm thinking to myself, I, I've never heard this kind of stuff before. I mean, I've heard variations of it from all related to abduction activity, but this isn't related to normal abduction activity where they take a person out of their house or their domicile or whatever it is and take them on board a UFO. That is not what that is. this is. This is something different. And so people have very different reactions to it. People, people don't know how, how, how to react to it. They think that people are, they have a sense that people are going to be in their homes. They have a sense that they're going to be outside with them, perhaps. That, that, that they have this other kind of life that's, uh, uh, in a sense, almost a more normal life. They're not on board a UFO. They're not lying on a table. And yet they have this other life where they're dealing with these people who are walking around in their house. I cannot tell you how many cases I have of that now. It is extremely common. It is new. I never heard things like this before. I'm not, I, and I'm not going to go into it because it's a whole, this is a, a 30 hour talk, but, um, but I, I had never heard things like this before. But what it does is it, it's coupled with regular abductions. They also still go on board and there are still grays there and they're still on the table and they're still uh, holding babies and this and that and all the rest of that stuff and that's happening as well. So what you're looking here, here is a net increase in the amount of frequency of abduction events if you then include as an abduction any kind of contact and therefore being in control of any by any uh, or, uh, hybrid or alien of any sort anywhere. And that would be a, a much better way to look at abductions. It doesn't have to be an actual abduction on board an object. It can simply be in the control of a hybrid. That's good enough. That's an abduction event and you may not ever leave your house. Something like that I never considered to be possible when I first started doing this research. It was not, it was not within my purview. It made no sense to me. It wasn't something that, that, I, that, that I would even listen to. I would, it sounded crazy. Now I'm forced to deal with it, and I'm forced to deal with the impact that it has on these people's lives. Something that is just so extraordinary, so unusual, it's, it's, just, it's, it's hard to imagine. And yet it is happening. It is something that must be imagined. It is something that, that, that rules people's lives. It's something that they can't get around, that they can't get over. And it even goes further than that. <laughs> As we go deeper and deeper into this, it is the fact that when they start to talk about this subject, there is a much greater increase in the problem of secrecy. Talking about hybrids walking around in their house or outside or wherever it is has suddenly become an enormously big deal. They are therefore not in compliance. 
because compliance means not talking about this now. In the old days, a couple of years ago, people would say, you know, I'm, I'm remembering everything I'm telling it to Dave Jacobs. And they'd say, well, that's not good. That's bad. Don't do that. He's, he's not a good person. Don't tell him anything. You're endangering future generations. Now get on the table. Now, now they say, you are not to do that under any circumstances. You are not in compliance. This is not allowed. We will punish you if you do this. This is bad. You must not tell this to anyone, ever. If you continue to do this, we will take measures against you. Now you have this whole world of measures against them for disclosing, for not being in compliance, for acting as they say, as for, for betraying them. This is betrayal. Well, you push them to the ground, to the floor, you pick them up by their hair. Okay, that we know. You kick them on their legs so that they get bruising on their legs. I've seen that quite a bit when they're on the floor. You twist their arms, causing bruising to their arms. You do things that aren't really going to cause any permanent damage to them, but scare them to death. If they continue to disclose, talk with me, for instance, or other researchers, well, other measures can be taken. You can threaten them. Threaten them with death. Why not? If you're going to threaten them, you might as well go all the way. We'll kill you. Well, killing one would be counterproductive, it seems to me. I mean, if, if they have a lifetime invested in them and they're trying to get them to do all sorts of things, and they, then the best thing to do is just to leave them alone and go about their business, and, and, and that's it. Killing them would be losing one that they have invested uh, a lot of energy and time. So that's probably never going to happen. But the abductee doesn't know that. We will kill your children. We will, you know how we've had uh, relations with you? Well, here's your 14-year-old daughter. We're going to do that to her. Do you want that done to her? Uh, these oftentimes work. These are direct threats of violence and sexual assault on people. Now, for the woman who lives in Scotland who has no kids and who has no family and no, no friends, really, no family, they, they look at their family pictures and they say, and her mother and her father are still alive. We'll, we will kill your mother and your father. We'll kill you. Then we'll kill your mother and your father. Uh, and, uh, and, um, and, of course, there's threats on the person she's disclosing to, known as me. We will kill him. He will die. And she'll see images of me floating face down in a pool of water. And I realized, what kind of image is that? And the answer is they don't know what I look like. <laughs> she lives in Scotland. <laughs> never, I've never met her. <laughs> so, so she's. I'm facing face, floating face down a pool of water, dead, and it'll be her fault. She caused it. She is the one who's the guilty one, because she was not in compliance. I've had several people talk to me about these threats on me. Uh, and how, the, how guilty they feel talking to me now because they know that they might bring some sort of threat on me. And, uh, and I must say, I, I tend to take these things seriously sometimes myself. It's, it has been a, a little bit of a wild ride that I've been on uh, for both me and for my wife, something that uh, we, we, we never really expected. And, uh, um, but then just talking to me brings up guilt in them. Guilt, she... Should they be saying this to me? Should they, be, should they be disclosing this to me? They're putting me in danger, and I have to assure them, oh, that's ridiculous. You're not putting me in danger? Why, that's nonsense. And the answer is, I don't know. Maybe they are. You know, I, mean, I can't guarantee that for myself. Uh, but, but I can't let them feel guilty, obviously, obviously for, for anything like that. Uh, so they have, to, they, have to, they have this whole range, this world that they live in, 
it's not just that you're an abductee. It's that there's this world of events that's happening that are extremely important that have to do with you and your family and missing time sequences and, and missing calls from school and, 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 and falling in love with people who you don't want to fall in love with and, 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 and having dream lovers. And, and this is this, the world of abductees. It's, it's not like you just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. There's, there's a whole different sort of worldview involved with it. So people who are aware abductees, who know what's happening to them, and that's, that's really the critical thing, who know what's happening to them, are also uncovering this world that they have to live in. And the question then is, of course, the ethical question is, am I, am I doing the right thing by doing this or not? You know, I mean, should, maybe, maybe ignorance is blessed. Maybe they shouldn't know anything about this. Maybe, maybe they'd be better off just leading their normal lives and not and wondering why they're never around to answer the phone and, and not knowing, you know. Uh, that's, that's, that's something that's, um, that's, that, that's my own moral dilemma, and I, I sort of leave it up to them, you know, we, we can stop anytime you want, and you don't, you know, maybe it is better not to know this, and they, you know, they want to go forward, and that's okay with me, but it is a, a little bit of a moral problem. So, to sum up, it's not a situation that, uh, that uh, one would normally assume. It's not something people who are abducted don't normally have uh, just abductions, and that's it, and they go about, and they lead a normal life. There's this whole world that they have entered into, and they entered into it as children, as babies, essentially, that they have lived in all their lives. The problem here is that it is dynamic, and that it has been changing, and that it has been increasing in frequency, and we get more hybrid stuff, and we get much more um, uh, problems of, of disclosure, problems of talking, and all these things, all leading up to the, to, to the sense that there's this, a greater disruption in their normal lives than, they, than ever before, and, and there's a greater disruption in their normal relationships with the world around them as well. So, far, so it's, uh, it's, not, it's not enough to say a person is an abductee. What you have to say is a person now lives in an abduction world, in essence. So, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. I will take some Q&A. I will take some questions and answers if that's okay and maybe we can... Thank you, thank, thank you. Maybe we can have the lights on and, and, and if anybody has any questions we can, we can sort of deal with that. Yeah, if we can have lights on. Ah, much better, much Testing. better, much better. Thank you. Testing. These lights are, are very, very bright. That's why I was looking over there most of the time because I look over there, it's like, ugh. <laughs> Testing. A question, a question. Uh, in past readings, past conferences, perhaps from you or from Dr. Mack, we heard that it's possible to resist. That is, can, if you find someone, a hybrid in your house, can you tell them to get out? The question is, if you find a hybrid in the house, can you tell them to get out? Can you resist? The answer is yes and no. Resistance does not, when people resist, you're dealing with a certain kind of behavior that is, I think, genetic as opposed to willful. Most people don't resist anything ever at any time and just go along with whatever it is. And they can't. They want to, but they, they can't. They don't even occur to them, you know. The ones, some of the people I've dealt with are natural born resistors. And they'll say, and, and, and they'll say, get up on a table. And they'll say, no, I'm not going to get up on a table. And then they'll have to be forced to get up on the table. Or else they'll have to be calmed down neurologically, and then they get up on the table. But the answer is, that they cannot say, go away. And in fact, when there is a, one of these hybrid types in the area, in the room with them, who is having his way with her or whatever it is, they can't say no except every once in a while I will get somebody who can say no. It's extremely unusual and it causes major disturbance for them and it is almost not worth it 
and they, they lapse out of compliance and it is bad and it is horrible and they can be punished severely for it and um, but it's unusual it is unusual it is not something that occurs uh, routinely it's uh, it's something that's always amazing for me to hear I want to commend you for using the word abductee and I want to make a plea to the UFO community please dump this expression experiencer I'm writing a book called Freedom from Religious Guilt and it urges people to go from being believers to experiencers and they are going to think of nothing but rectal probes and sperm extraction. Um, please, please go back to abductee. If, you do, if it's done against your will, um, the newscaster will say, we're trying to minimize collateral damage. And that's such a nice, soft-sounding term. And it means we're killing innocent men, women, and children in Iraq. And it, uh, it, yet collateral damage sounds so soft. Experiencer sounds so soft. In my bathroom is toilet paper. It's not bathroom tissue. So please, I plead with you to get back to abductee, and I commend you once again. Well, thank you. It's, it, believe me, it's, it's not something that I, that I think a lot about. I just, <laughs> I grew up with the word, <laughs> and, it's, and, and I never quite got used to experience her. And the whole, the whole concept of, of using that word as an experiencer is, uh, has a long and jaded history, and it was, it was actually formulated as an attack, essentially, on people who felt that the phenomenon was not in the best interest of people, let's put it that way. And, and when you change it from abductee to experiencer, well, anybody can experience sort of anything. I mean, if you do go on a river raft, well, that's an experience. And, uh, but I never liked the word abductee. There's something harsh about it. There's something uh, I, I don't I don't like it, and in fact, in, in the in the mid '80s, I was at a conference where a group of people uh, who were abductees and other researchers got together and tried to figure out what. This is before the word experiencer came up. Try to figure out what other word can we use other than abductee because you can't just define a person by the fact that they're taken up. You know that's that their whole definition of this person is an abductee. It's it's not not right. And, um, but nobody could come up with another word. That was the problem. So when, when experiencer came along, um, it was another word, but it was so different than what abductees had been experiencing, so to speak, that, that, they, that there, it immediately caused a sort of conflict within the UFO research community as to which word to use. So I think maybe perhaps the best thing to do is to say abduction experiencer. And that sort of, you know, bridges both worlds, but it's cumbersome. That's the problem. You're adding all these syllables, so I just say abductee again. <laughs> uh, thank you much, uh, Dr. Jacobs. It's a pleasure to have you here. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, some years ago, in the MUFON Journal, was a experiencer who was an abductee, and he had a helmet. Uh, that went over your head at night, and he claimed that this helmet with the right stuff in it would prevent uh, being an abductee. And he asked for people to come forward and uh, just ask for the uh, helmet, as you right. know about it. Yeah, there's a man by the name of Michael Mencken who puts a sort of polyurethane, he puts some sort of filter in a kind of well, it looks like a World War I flyer's helmet, this leather thing. That, and, um, and he says that people who, uh, who've had abduction experiences will wear it, and then it, it seems to stop the abduction experiences. And, he, and he's got a, a lot of people saying this. And, and the answer is, um, I don't know whether it stops the experiences or not, but I have actually encouraged him because I think he's on the right track. I think that what you're dealing with here is, is if a person can be controlled, and they can be controlled from a distance, then it's got to be neurological control, obviously, and it's got to penetrate the, the noggin, to use a scientific terminology. And um, if that happens, how can you prevent it from, from piercing the noggin? 
And so he, he is the one person who, know, who figured this out, basically, and said, well, what we've we got to do is we have to have a covering on the head. Well, you, you can't walk around 24 hours a day wearing a World War I helmet or something, or that's actually it's this leather flyer's ace, you know, the, that thing. Anyway, uh, and, and it doesn't cover the whole face either. It just, it, and, and it's really, it's, you can't walk outside with it. Let's put it that way. You can only wear it in, in the privacy of your own home. Uh, but, um, but the problem here and is you have to have a certain kind of scientific approach to it. And the first approach you have to have is we do know a little bit about brainwave te technology. We know that if you put electrodes on people's, there's the alpha, the beta, the theta, the delta, whatever brain waves. The question then is, has in, or if there's any neurologist out there in this audience, you please answer this question for me. There's, I've tried to look for, neuro, for sympathetic neurologists. There, there are not a lot of them. There's no neurologist on MUFON's uh, uh, list of uh, consultants and so forth. But the question is, if you if you can measure by attaching electrodes, measure brain waves, can you, at what point can you, do you stop, what, which brain waves are getting through? Now, if you then lift the electrodes up a quarter of an inch, can you still measure those brain waves? Now, however, that can be done. In other words, which waves travel the longest and, and which waves are blocked uh, early, you know, at the shortest. And therefore, you have to build a contraption that will be in some way related to actual brain wave activity, as opposed to what he's doing, which is just, just putting the shield. And if you can do that, then I think that you're, you're, a much, more, you're much more scientifically grounded. But the problem is, is that people do not know much about brain waves after they leave the head. <laughs> they, they just know from, from the, the skulls and that's it. So, uh, but as crazy as it sounds, I think, I think he's on the right track. Now the problem with saying it stopped the abductions is we don't know how many times they've been abducted and they don't remember that they were abducted and they think that the helmet stopped it. So you see, they don't know, we don't know how many times they were told to take off the helmet before the abduction and then have an abduction then put it back on and say, see, nothing happened to me. I'm still wearing a helmet and nothing happened because I don't remember anything in the middle. That we can't measure. So even when you get the anecdotal evidence out that yes, it stops it, I also have people who say I couldn't wear it, that I was forced to take it off. And I also have people say it didn't matter. And I, yeah, but, but he's on to something, which is why Thank I still you. encourage him. He's on to something. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Jacobs. Uh, my question is regard. I know that you've been doing this for at least ten years, twelve years. How many years? How many have? How, how many years have I been doing this? I've been doing abduction and UFO research for 41 years and doing abduction research uh, uh, starting without abductions in, uh, since 1982 and abduction regression since 1986. Over that time period, you've had literally thousands of stories told to you. That is correct, yeah. And well, I, not exactly thousands, but over a thousand anyway. Okay. What I would like to know is over, that... Well, let me just say over a thousand, I've investigated myself thousands and tens and tens of thousands told to me, yes, but not that I've investigated. My question is that you have a lot of anecdotal stories, etc. Uh, what I would like to know is after hearing all these stories, what do you personally feel is the agenda of the abductors? Well, actually, I can, I can talk about that to a certain extent because I wrote that in my book, The Threat. And uh, I, this was the book. The book came out in '98, so it's uh, it's. Uh, I, you would think it's a little long in the tooth, but actually, it's. I reread it uh, recently in light of the previous years of knowledge that I've had, and it's not bad, pretty good. And uh, what I decided in that book was that this is a phenomenon that is not an a, a, an experiment. 
that it is not a learning situation, that it is not uh, uh, something where they just need to know about us, so they, they grab somebody and they examine them and they look at their feelings and they look at their this and they look at their that and whatever else they look at and all the rest of that stuff. This is uh, much, more, uh, much different than that. This is, in fact, a program. And as a program, it is administered almost assembly line fashion on one level. And uh, people are abducted all the, for, throughout the course of their lives and have been probably since the 1890s. Uh, and as a program, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And it's goal directed. And it's secret. They, and the, there's one reason, I have a whole chapter on secrecy in there for various reasons. I know a lot more about secrecy now than I ever knew. But the, the chapter that I did on secrecy in there was one of my proudest chapters. Nobody ever said a word about it, I'm ashamed to say. But, uh, but uh, it was to protect the fetus and to protect the program and to ensure the, the longevity of the program and, and all the rest of that stuff. The point is, is that the, that the um, secrecy program is extremely important. And without secrecy, once again, there'd be no abduction phenomenon. We'd know it, and they were coming, and, uh, and we'd get them. Uh, but the point is, is that they don't want us to know what they are doing. That is the bottom line that is simply not an arguable. It's not arguable. They are a secret because they don't want us to know what they're doing. Period. That is the bottom line. Maybe they're doing something wonderful and great and terrific, but they still don't want us to know. That's why it's secret. And um, uh, so this is a program that is leading to goals that they don't want us to want uh, to know. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't have spent all these years trying to figure it out, you know. And and if you're and if you don't haven't had hypnosis uh, with a Compton investigator. You know, people are, are very scattered. There's all sorts of different ways in which you can think about it, and people have different ideas and, 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 and different viewpoints, and, and, and uh, some of them are right on it, some of them are off of it, and, and it just, it's very, very, very scattered and very, very difficult to deal with unless people sort of know what happened to them. Not knowing what happened to them is a goal. <laughs> Absolutely. You don't want them to know what happened to them. You know, that's, 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 it's, it's, in our, it's in our interest to know, and it's in their interest to not know. They win, basically. So the question then is, well, what is the goal, you know? And um, in my humble opinion, based on a lifetime of putzing around with this subject, um, <laughs> and coming to conclusions that I am embarrassed to discuss, but I'm required to because I consider myself to be an academic and I'm supposed to go where the evidence leads me. And believe me, the evidence is, as I tried to explain to people, you're dealing with anecdotal evidence. You're dealing with physical evidence, obviously, as well, but primarily anecdotal as stories people tell you retrieved through hypnosis administered by amateurs. This is not what we call strong evidence. This is not the evidence that's going to really impress the scientific community. So given that, you still must go forward and say, okay, all right, it's evidence nonetheless. It might be the bottom of the pile of evidence, but it's evidence nonetheless and we've got a tremendous amount of it. And the internal consistency of the evidence is beyond imagination. It is breathtaking in terms of the detail uh, of what this phenomenon is like. And, you know, there's all sorts of phenomena that we know about, and we really just don't know much about it. We have surface knowledge of all sorts of paranormal phenomena. But with the abduction phenomenon, we have tremendous depth. I, to say that is, is, is to under, underestimate it. it, is, it I'm, I'm underemphasizing it. To say it's tremendous, it's, it's, it is literally mind-boggling how much we know about this subject that is completely consistent with what everybody has been saying for years and years and years and years and years and goes on and winds its way to an inexorable conclusion that I hope I will get to myself. And... Um, and so I do think uh, that this is, in fact, 
a building, a creating of these hybrids to look more and more human and to integrate into the society. And the problem with that is that they have the ability to control humans and we don't have the ability to control them. This is not the kind of situation I would like to see. I would like to see us have the ability to control them and them not have the ability to control us. See, that, that would be my ideal world. But that, I, don't, I, can't, I can't make that happen, unfortunately. And that's what people tell me over and over and over again as late as uh, Wednesday night. And so I, uh, I, can't, I can't do that. So that means that if this were to happen as people have been telling me and as the evidence, in my opinion, has, has sort of gone to, it means that uh, we will become essentially second-class citizens, in a sense. You know, there will be people who, who have these abilities to tell us to go over uh, to Starbucks and buy them a cup of coffee, and uh, we won't be able to say no, you know, or whatever they want to have us do. And um, so we, uh, I, I look to the future and I think, gosh, this is not the future that I envisioned when I first started looking at this subject. I was filled with enthusiasm. I loved it. It was wonderful. It was great. And this might be contact between two species. And we, we learn how to cure disease and stop war. And, and there had been exchange of information. And they could learn about us. And it didn't play out that way. I wanted it to. I was looking forward to it playing out that way. This would be wonderful. Just like, you know, I mean, just like sort of in science fiction. And, and then I realized there is no such thing as contact. This is a popular culture concept. It's not, it's not a real concept. It's just, it's just a, it's, uh, uh, there's, no, there's no evidence for the concept of contact. It's not, it does, it's not working out that way. <laughs> and so, uh, so I look forward and I'm, I look forward with a little bit of unease, I must say, just, just a tad of, a smidgen of unease. Uh, and, uh, but my job is, is not to talk about that so much. My job is to unravel what is happening, how it is happening, and how they're doing it, then that'll be the subject of my next book, which will be, how are they doing this? What is the bureaucracy involved with doing this? If you can imagine that. Uh, what are the functions of various people in doing this? What are the functions of various hybrids in doing this? Uh, how exactly do you integrate in this society and you don't have a social security card, for example? <laughs> well. I guess that's not a big problem for a lot of people in this society. These agents have one made for you, you know. But, um, but, there, but there's all sorts of other problems about doing that. Oh, two minutes remaining, sorry. And um, so that's what my conclusion is, that this is ultimately an integration program on some level, uh, uh, much as I am embarrassed to say that. Yes, I'm sorry to keep you standing David, there this whole time. I bought your first... UFO book back in the 70s. I still have it and I've shared it. And then in the library, I read Secret Life and the Threat, which I, and I want to thank you for all three of them. And uh, then uh, Virgil Staff had a review in the MUFON Journal of the Book of, of the Allies. So I ordered those and read those, and I found you were so much in accord. And, I, and they told me you didn't want to read it because well, I know of I read the channels, the, I, and I wondered if you ever did. Uh, the question is about the uh, Marshal uh, Vian Summers and the uh, Allies of Humanity, and I see I only have one, one minute left. This is what's called revealed knowledge. This is channeled knowledge, as he, as he readily admits, and we found that that with channel knowledge, it's sort of all over the place. It's just everywhere. And when you get everything all over the place, every once in a while you're going to get a hit. It's, it's the law of averages, you know. And so what happened is he got a hit, and, uh, and he is sort of uh, similar to mine, but um, I, I would be exceptionally careful with any kind of revealed knowledge. Thank you. I'm getting the wrap-it-up sign. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs>